Good evening, if you would, bow your head and for the word of prayer with me. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you now just thanking you for your son, for this church family, Father, for those around us. God, we ask a special prayer for those that are sick and ill that need your, need your help right now, those that are mourning, those that have unspoken troubles that need your, your guiding hand, Father. We ask for special prayers for all of them. Please be with the leaders of our nation. Please be with the leaders of our congregation. And God, help us to strive daily to walk in your footsteps, to be an example of what Jesus, uh, Jesus' love is as we go out and encounter people in the world. Uh, in Christ's name, amen. Welcome, everybody, to the July 1st evening service. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love.
So what I like about that whole picture, probably more than anything else, is Lauren and Barrett turning to Lawson and going to go, we're going to show you how to do that. That's what you want to keep up. That whole idea of mentoring starts early and teaching starts early. And so that's just a, it is a great picture about how we learn and how we need each other. So um, I love this time together. 
We're going to be in Acts chapter 9 as we continue to talk about uh, the fact that there are uh, no little guys. That there's, it's, when, we, when we talk about the biblical story, there are people that don't get as much press as others, uh, but every story that is in the Bible is chosen by God. It is, it is a story, it, it is an event that the Holy Spirit has decided to move uh, through the mind and through the heart of, of a writer. Uh, in in this particular case, it's Luke as he recounts um, the the ministry of the early church. But this story is chosen because God felt like we needed to know something about it. And so we talk about no little guys, no little stories. Every story is important, and every story has something to teach. Uh, and tonight we're going to talk about uh, a woman named Tabitha or Dorcas. And so we start in Acts chapter nine, verse thirty six, where it says there. Uh, now, there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days, she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. So Tabitha's got a story, and Tabitha's story starts in in sort of her relationships with the world and sort of her work environment, what it is that she did. She's described as a, as being full of good works and acts of charity, which means she's had a heart for people. She's got a heart for uh, understanding what people need and understanding what people ha- ha- desire in their life. So she she's willing to fill that need. She's willing to work uh, in the lives of people. And so we get this picture of, of a woman who works. But Tabitha's story, that's not the most important part of Tabitha's story. And the most important part of Tabitha's story in the beginning is that Tabitha dies. And it's, so it's kind of a bummer. So we looked last week at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and talked about the fact that, you know, they stood up in front of the king and they said, we will die if God desires that we die. And then God didn't desire that they died and God protected them in the fire. And Tabitha's story is different. Tabitha is full of good works. She's full of charity. She's somebody who loves the people around her. She loves the church. She's somebody who is, is known in the community. Uh, she's a hard worker and she dies. And you go, oh, that's, you know, it's, that's a bummer. Because, you know, it's not a Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego story. And, and yet, it, for Tabitha, that's where, that's where her story really does sort of kick off for us in the book of Acts. Is that this is a moment when her impact is going to be seen far and wide, and she is the one who is, is dead. And so in verse 38, it says, Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. And so Peter rose and went with them. And so as she as she dies, they participate in the ritual. They wash her. They're in an upper room. There's no question about the fact that she's gone. But the disciples around her understand that her condition is is what it is unless God intervenes. Now, this is where it is sort of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is that her situation is what is unless God intervenes. And so they decide to send for Peter because they're in a place where Peter is close. They're in Joppa, which is modern-day Tel Aviv, and and he is in Lydda, which is just not very far away. And so they say, Peter, why don't you come over here and visit with us because Tabitha has died, because Dorcas has died. And so Peter gets up and he goes. And so the second part of Tabitha's story is that her friends send for Peter. And again, I think it's important to understand the connection of friends. They're looking out for her when she can't look out for herself. They're saying, what can we do for her when she's in a position when she can't do anything for for herself or anything for us, which is not the usual position for Tabitha. Tabitha is usually the one who's at the center of, of the activity. We all know folks like that. She's at the center of activity. She's at the center of pushing things. She's the one that's looking at the needs. She's the one that sees what needs to happen. She's going, oh, you need to call over here. We need to go visit. We need to do this. We need to do. That's the way her character is described. But now when she can't, her friends get up and go, we have learned from her what to do. And so they do it. And they say the best thing for her is we're going to send for Peter. We're going to see what it is that Peter can do. And so Peter gets this message uh, where they they two men come and they say to him, please come with us without delay. Verse 39, Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the windows stood, all the widows, sorry, stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. And so there's, 
there's a, a this group that is honoring her mem memory. Here's what she did. Here's what she made. Here's the things that she was involved with. They're weeping. They're emotionally crushed at the loss that they have. Uh, verse 40, but Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Third part of Tabitha's story. She rises. She gets up. She lives. She was dead at one point in time. She has encountered the power of God, and she lives. And so this is her, her story. This is what, what makes her special. This is what speaks to us, what the Holy Spirit has given to speak to us. Verse 41, he, Peter, gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. And so the, the final part of her story is this, that people believe in Jesus. So she rises and everybody goes, Peter did this wonderful thing. And what happens? People believe in Jesus. People say, Jesus is amazing. People say, Jesus can raise the dead. Jesus can change life. Jesus can bring what is gone and give it usefulness again. That, that Tabitha lives. And that's her story. And so it's really one of the more simple stories we've looked at in the whole series. You know, we've, we've looked at some of the others, and there was some history to deal with. And there was some circumstances to deal with. There's, this one's easy. Tabitha lived a life where she embraced God and did good. And when she died, Peter came and raised her from the dead. And what happened was people saw Jesus in that moment. And so when we look at, at Tabitha and we say, what is the big faith moment with Tabitha, the big faith moment is simply that she is servant-hearted. If we look at the story and we see who she is, the, the, the description of her is she, is she is full of acts of charity and she does good works. That she has this love for people. And that's what defines her. What do the friends show Peter when they come? Oh, these are the tunics that she made. Let me tell you about all the things that she did. Let me tell you about how it is that she really represented God well in life, how she treated other people. And, and when she's raised, all of the credit goes back to Jesus because that's what Tabitha did in the beginning. If she gave Jesus credit for what it was that was going on, I would have to assume because that's the reputation that we see. She is servant-hearted. She helped others. And when, when she needed help, other people helped her. And so that's it. So what do we learn from Tabitha. How can I grow to be like Tabitha? I love the story, one, because it is short, because we're all going to get out of church early. Not really. I've got a lot to say in the next section. Um, but, you know, you think, oh, we're going to get out early. It's a short story. But it, it's, it's a really practical story. It, this is one of those things that's, that when you begin to look at Tabitha, you say, what is it about Tabitha in terms of how she serves that really shines? One thing is that it's very it's very practical. When she decided to live out faith, she decided to do it in a way that other people would know her. Acts of charity. When she decided that she was going to live out faith, she looked around her and she said, how can I go be the presence of Christ in the life of somebody else? How can I fulfill a need? If I've got to sew a tunic or make a tunic and take it over there, that's the need I'm going to fulfill. I'm going to go give somebody a shirt. I'm going to go make sure somebody has something to wear. I'm going to go make sure that they have something to eat. I would think that's an act of charity. I'm going to go make sure that their kids have what they need to start school. I'm going to go make sure that they, you can imagine all kinds of things, but everything that we'd have to imagine around Dorcas is something that's practical. She looks at people and she says, what can I go to do to serve them? What can I go to, to do there? Sometimes we approach faith as if it is all in the head is if it is all about what we know or all about what we can connect in terms of the dots or all about what we can you know, establish in sort of a theological principle. And, and we look at some of these things and we look at a place like Acts chapter 6 and there's a difference between ministry of the Word and the ministry of the table and the apostles have to be about the ministry of the Word. And so that's the more important thing. And that's not the message of Acts chapter 6. The, Acts, the message of Acts chapter 6 is the ministry of the Word, as they put it, and the ministry of the table are simply two different things in ministry. Not that one is more important than the other, not that one has greater value than the other, but that the two are different. 
and people do different things in ministry. When Dorcas dies, there is an impact on what she does. I, I, I tell this story uh, multiple times. When I first came to Spring Creek, I was reading in a magazine, and there was a, there was a question that was posed in an article that said, if you close the doors of your church today, would anybody in the community notice tomorrow? And I thought, man, that's a really good question. Because I have been a part of churches that if they closed the doors today, it would take months before anybody realized it was closed. And they would notice because the grass would have grown up. They would have noticed because the building would start to fall down. They would notice because the, the parking lots would look a little degraded. They wouldn't know because they had not felt the presence of the church. That wouldn't be the reason they question. It would be the condition of the building that they would question. But if Spring Creek closed today, would anybody notice tomorrow? Well, I think that they would. I know that it wouldn't take until Wednesday for somebody to notice because we'd have 100 people in line for pantry and they would go, where are the people that usually give us what we need? Where are the people who usually help us to live for another two weeks? Where are the people who usually instill those very physical things that are necessary for life that my family depends on? But I think that they might notice on Tuesday when they come by and they go, you know what? There's usually something going on there. Man, they got kids running out of the building and their families and their, I know during a school year, our Mother's Day out people would go, where are they at? Why did they close? My kids learned something here. My kids experience great teaching and they experience it. I get to take a nap on Tuesdays and Thursdays because my kids go to MD. They would notice something. There's stuff that goes on here on Mondays. There's stuff that goes on here on Wednesdays. That goes on here on Fridays. I had a lady, one of our MDO teachers stopped me a couple of months ago. I was telling this story in the elders meeting a couple of months ago. And she stopped me. And she said, there's more stuff goes on in this building than any place I've ever been. And I went, I know. Isn't it terrible? I mean, we're busy all the time. We can't find time to get a funeral in here half the time. People call and go, you know, I want to use the building for all. Oh, we can't use the building. Well, you know, I want to do this. Oh, you can't do that. We got Mother's Day out. You can't do that. We got a pantry. You know, you can't do that because we got this going. Go there. And when you're in the office, it's easy for all that to be a headache. It's easy for all that to be simply menial stuff. It's, it's, it's easy for all that to be one more thing on the calendar. But the reality is, in the lives of the people that we deal with, it is a vital link to life. It is a vital link to what it is that Jesus does. It is a vital link to seeing how God moves. That what goes on here is not just a matter of who cooks, it's a matter of the fact that we feed and we care. It's not just a matter of who teaches, it's a matter of how we invest in kids and how we, and how we love. Tabitha has that reputation that what she does makes an immediate practical difference in the lives of people. And if you're going to be practical, you've got to be deliberate. You've got to be ready to go out. You've got to be ready to make the visit. You've got to be ready to cook the casserole. You've got to be ready to share the shirt. You've got to be ready to do that. And Tabitha was ready. It seemed like she, she had this reputation that she was ready. I mean, when Peter shows up, they don't tell stories about what she did before. They say, look, she's got these tunics, and this is what she makes. She's ready for the next person. She's ready for whoever it is that may walk in the door. She's prepared to do that. Very practical in the way to, to do that. She picked a place to minister, and then she gave herself to that. That's what it means to be servant-hearted. It's to say, what can I do, and then give yourself to that. And it doesn't matter what part of that is, ministry of the table, ministry of the word, ministry of, it just matters that you find a place to invest and you do it. And you do it deliberately, you do it well, you do it consistently, and you let God use you in that place. The second thing I think that we learn in terms of what he wanted is it's personal. That when Peter goes, he doesn't find a group of strangers that stood there and went, um, there was a lady here and she used to give us clothes and we were back for more and she's not around. There were people that were weeping because their friend had died. There were, peop there were people who, there who the, the text says, are her friends. They know where the stuff is that she serves with. They know where she lives. They know what they can expect. They know, who she, they know what she's about. Because for Tabitha, the people that she serves are important. They are the people that, again, are the friends and the widows that surround her at the time of her death. They go to Peter and say, she has passed, let us tell you about her. 
Let us tell you about the woman that we knew. Let us tell you about the woman who was active in our life. Let us tell you about this person who knew us. Ministry is meant to be personal. Service is meant to be personal. Service is not meant to simply be this thing that we sort of cast our bread upon the waters and hope that it all comes. It is meant to drive us into the lives of people who have a need. That when we talk about being servant-hearted or being ministerial, it is about learning names and faces and situations and circumstances and helping people walk through messiness in order to find Jesus. It's about looking at somebody saying, I'm willing to invest in you. I'm willing to know who you are and know what you're about in order to help you be what you need to be. One of the things I love about Spring Creek is I'm, and I'm on the receiving end of folks that write emails or folks that make calls and they go, this is the friendliest group of people ever. I mean, this morning, I'm, I'm here this morning and I'm over here talking and somebody says, I love Spring Creek is the most special place ever. I say, yes, it is. They got a great preacher. And I'm over here and I'm talking to this group of visitors. And they say, everybody has it. I say, yes, it is. They get that from the preacher. And as I, and I say, no, I don't say that. But I get to hear what you do. I could not get out of here without telling five people my name. I think that's a great thing. Because when a person visits, it's not about the fact they just showed up. It's about knowing who visited. Who are you? Where are you from? Do you have kids? What, what's your family like? Man, we want you to be here because we've got great things going on. We want you to be here because we got, we want you to be here because we got a chart on the wall. And if I get enough on the chart, then the preacher gets a raise. And I, no, it's not the way it works. Personal says, I want to know who you are and where you fit here. See, Tabitha knew the people that she served. They were her friends in that way. When we make ministry, when we make service simply about scattering something out, we miss the power of the gospel. The gospel is really intimate. It is, it is described as God sending his son into the world. But the reality is, is it's Jesus who comes to you and says, are you on a personal level ready to commit? You have to make the decision to die to self. You have to make the decision to walk with Christ. I don't get to make that decision for anybody else. If I got to make that decision for anybody else, everybody would be Christian. That's just the way it would be. But I don't get to make that decision for everybody. Everybody has to encounter Jesus on their own and make that personal decision. See, the gospel is a personal thing. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with this relationship that Jesus offers, with this life that Jesus invites us into? And so service, ministry, how we deal with other folks, when we look like Jesus in that place, it's personal. We get to know names and people in messiness. Why do we meet up for community dinner table once a quarter? Because it's just another way to feed people. That's not the purpose of that. I think we've explained that. The purpose of that is to sit down with our neighbors and say, who are you? What is your name? What is your situation? We want to know how best to present Jesus to them. But we don't know that if all we do is to take sort of this scattered out there and hope something sticks. I understand the parable of the sower. But there is something intentional about the way that we serve. We can look and say, this is the way that we can help you look like Jesus. So we help you make a commitment. I will be forever grateful for somebody who knew my dad well enough when he was lost to show up at our front door and say, let's go fishing. Because if my dad was going to accept something, it's going to be a trip to go fishing. Let's go have a Bible study. My dad said, no, thank you. Let, let, let's go to churches. And my dad said, no, that's good for you. I'm not going to do that. If he had showed up and said a hundred different things, my dad would have had a hundred ways to say no. But he knew my dad well enough. He had taken time to know my dad well enough to show the door and say, let's go fishing. And to have a Bible in the boat when he got out there and he was trapped. No, that's not the way it worked. But it, it was but it was a relational kind of thing. Those personal connections change lives. And that's the way it's intended to be. That's, that's the way it's intended. We go into the world and we deal with people one by one situation by situation, circumstance by circumstance. <laughs> Three, <coughs> what we learn from the story of Tabitha is that Tabitha points people to Jesus. And it's that way in the beginning, before she dies, it's that way 
during the time that she's dead. And it's that way when she's raised to life. That whenever we look at Tabitha's story before, what she does, people connect to the fact that she's a person of faith. She's connected to Peter, who's connected to Jesus. She points that direction. When she dies, where do they look around for help? They look to Peter because Peter's going to take them to Jesus. Jesus can do something in that situation. And then she's raised to life. Who gets the credit? Jesus gets the credit. Let's go out there and talk about what it is that Jesus has done and how it is. Everything about Tabitha simply points to Jesus. And that's the, that's the key to really good service in our lives. When we talk about, I want, to, I want to grow to be like Tabitha, we ask ourselves, is the stuff I do connected to what it is that Jesus does? Do I do good things and take credit for something that maybe Jesus deserves? And there's no maybe in that. God is the giver of all good gifts. So anything good I do comes from God. Who deserves the credit? God does. And so am I active in that? Man, I really appreciate you showing up after the hurricane and helping me rake the yard. Oh, you're welcome. I'm a pretty good person. I like to do that. I really like to work in the yards, and so it's not a big deal. I really like to. That's a good answer. It's a nice answer, it's, but it's an, it's an inefficient answer. Do we, do we take that opportunity to say, hey, Jesus loves people. I love people. I wanted to help. You know, I, I see beauty in creation, and your yard was not looking beautiful, so I wonder you'd be able to see God. It's something, anything to connect that to Jesus. Somehow Tabitha, when she did her acts of charity, people knew that they were there was an act of love because it came from her and it was motivated by her relationship with Jesus. They knew to go to Peter because she's connected. They knew to give credit to Jesus afterwards because she had connected those things in her life. When we talk about why we serve or what we serve, we serve in order to point people to see who Jesus is. And we have to be very deliberate about connecting the dots there very deliberate about being able to say, this is what Jesus does, and this is why I do it. I think that's one of those things that's important. I think we have this tendency to believe that um, if we go out and do something good, people will just naturally say, oh, he must be a Christian. But people don't naturally do that. There's all kinds of reasons why people might think you're good. You know, he just wants to keep the property values up, so he came out to rake, you know. He's a good neighbor. He's retired. He didn't have anything else to do. He just came out. He's a good guy. He just likes yard work. He's just a decent human being. He's just a... Are there are all kinds of, of reasons why people may give that you've done something good. We have to be deliberate about saying the reason we're good is because God is good. There's a fellow who came to Jesus once. He said, good teacher. And you remember what Jesus' response was? Why do you call me good? Only God is good, right? And there's a lot of reasons why Jesus would say that. But I think the lesson in, in some place for me is, is even Jesus said, if you're going to think about goodness, I want you to connect that to what God does. And I want you to connect that to the character of God and who God is doing. And so when we do things and people come and say, man, you're really good. We've got to be able to figure out like Jesus how to say, man, I'm a reflection of what it is that God is working on in me. I've got a ways to go. But, you know, God is really at work in that place. And this is why we do it. Tabitha's story is short. Tabitha's story is to the point. Um, but Tabitha's story is very practical. It says, if I want to make an impact or have a difference, there's a place that I can serve. It's very personal. It's about me investing in a ministry that helps somebody that I'm going to know see Jesus. It points to Jesus. It says, my task is to help one other person today, see what it is that Jesus is doing. And if we give ourselves to that kind of, of ministry, that kind of service, it's a tremendous impact. When Tabitha dies, everybody knows and everybody comes. It's funny to me that her story begins there because that's where our story begins. Our story always begins with our own death. We die to self to walk with Christ in the waters of baptism. And what happens? Jesus steps in and raises us back to life. And from then on, we point to Jesus. That's what we do. That's what we're about. It's what Tabitha was about. It's what we want to be about. It's what we want to invite you to be about. The gospel is simple. We are fallen people 
Jesus loves us enough to go to a cross, and then he calls us to follow him. If you need to answer that invitation, we're going to invite you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing. good to see all of you this evening. Is there anybody here that needs to take communion tonight? Well, this is usually when Mitchell Gibson raises his hand. He had he had knee surgery. Bill, do you have an update on Mitchell? Okay, well, good. I understand that's typical, <laughs> the pain. Uh, do have an update uh, on a couple of folks. Kevin Johnson apparently had one knee uh, done, not, not both, um, but he's doing fine. And then Vincent Dean, who I mentioned had three surgeries, he's uh, Patty Johnson's father. And so we'll pray, continue to pray for him as well. Um, I don't have anything else. Let's close. Dear Holy Father, again, we're, we're thankful for being here this evening. We're, we're thankful for the lesson from your word. And Father, to, to be reminded of, of the impact that we can have on all of those around us. Father, we ask that you'd continue to be with Mitchell, with, with his recovery, uh, with Kevin and Vincent um, and their uh, recoveries. We just pray that that goes well. Uh, we ask that you'd be with um, Audrey, who's having cataract surgery Wednesday, and uh, be with uh, the Hopper family, who's, who have lost uh, their loved one. Uh, Father, just uh, bless us. Be with all those uh, going to jam camp this week. We pray for a great experience for, for all involved, with the, the kids and the adults. Uh, we pray for their safety. Uh, be with us this week. Help us to share the good news of Jesus to all those that we encounter. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.